Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbore University, which is funded by a grant through the US Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University. Today's webinar is entitled Long-Term Impacts and Management of Emerald Ash Borer and is presented by Kathleen Knight, research ecologist with the US Forest Service, whose current research deals with the effects of emerald ash borer on forest communities. Our part to our participants today, we welcome your questions and comments. Please type them in the Q&A feature or the chat pod and we will respond to them after the webinar presentation. Tomorrow, you will receive an email with a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include Dr. Knight's contact information if you have questions or comments after the webinar is over. For those of you wanting CEUs, this email will be especially important as it gives information on how to attain these CEUs for viewing this live webinar. The webinar right now is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbore.info website. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Kathleen, you can unmute your mic and begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be here with you and I appreciate you joining on, on what is a, a cold and um, sleet and ice and snow kind of day here uh, in Ohio. So it's, it's wonderful to be with you um, to talk to you a little bit about some of our research and some of our uh, update you on some of our more recent uh, findings. So I know this is EAB University, so everyone is likely familiar with this character. Um, the emerald ash borer is a beetle that was accidentally introduced from Asia. Um, the adult beetles emerge from ash trees in the spring. They lay eggs on the bark of ash trees and the ash borer larva tunnels beneath the bark. And as it feeds beneath the bark of the trees on the phloem layer and scoring into the xylem a little, creating those feeding galleries, um, those actually disrupt the flow of water and nutrients within the tree, killing the tree over time. Emerald ash borer was first discovered in southeast Michigan in 2002. Um, it had been there since the mid-1990s, and it's spread since then throughout the region, mostly by human transport. <clears throat> And so you can see the counties colored in the red uh, tones there have been infested now, some of them for uh, about 20 years. Um, so you've had the time for the ash trees to die and smaller trees to grow up into larger size classes. In those blue tones are, are trees that died maybe a decade ago. Um, and, and or, or places that were infested a decade ago. And so those, those places now have um, very high or complete mortality of ash trees as well. So we can see this very broad impact through the region and even into these uh, yellow areas more recently infested that are starting to see those impacts. Emerald ash borer infestation has spread through a large range of what is inhabited by the ash species here in the US. There are still some areas, as you can see, that have a lot of ash density that are not yet infested. And so those areas are of particular concern as emerald ash borer continues to spread. Now, when we talk about ash being infested by emerald ash borer, there are actually multiple ash species. We have 16 different ash species here in the US. Five of them are native to Ohio. And these species are all very different ecologically. They inhabit different types of habitats. They play different roles in their forest ecosystems. And so we really need to think about the impacts and management of emerald ash borer separately for these different tree species. I'll go over a few of them right now. So black ash is a more northern ash species, has a more northern range. It inhabits wet areas like swamp forests and floodplain forests. 
And it's particularly important in northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and some areas of Maine. Green ash uh, is a very widespread species. It inhabits uh, floodplains. It can be dominant in our floodplain forests, uh, but it, it has a range of habitats that it inhabits as well. White ash is a more upland hardwood forest species, uh, and it grows mixed uh, in these mixed stands with other, other hardwood species. Pumpkin ash is such a cool one. It's a more southern species that inhabits uh, wetter forests, swamps, and floodplains. Um, it looks very similar to green ash. And in Ohio, we get mixed stands of pumpkin ash, green ash, and black ash all growing together. The Samaras of the pumpkin ash are, are distinctive, and that's what I use to uh, distinguish that species from green ash. And then finally, the blue ash, this is such a cool species. So it has these stems that are winged like a euonymus uh, with the uh, four angled uh, kind of wings on the twigs. It has a very restrictive, restricted native range um, in the Midwest. And it typically inhabits areas that have high calcium soils. So we see it here in Ohio in places that have limestone cliffs. The impacts of emerald ash borer are far reaching. So tree species, especially species that are abundant and have unique characteristics in their ecosystem can be foundation species in forest ecosystems. And that means the loss of those species can have a large impact on the ecosystem that they occur in. When we're thinking about ash, just the physical structure of the tree can produce shade and habitat. Um, that's important for many wildlife species, including birds. The leaves, the samaras, and even the wood of the tree uh, is important uh, food for many different organisms, including insects, especially, that form the base of food webs, um, as well as in these more swamp and floodplain forests, as the foliage and seeds fall into, um, into the water, they can form the base of aquatic food webs. The, uh, Leaf litter that's, that's typically high nutrient can affect nitrogen cycling in these systems. The microbial community near ash trees is different from the microbial community near other trees. So, and which um, you'll hear if you talk to morel mushroom hunters. So there's just a range of, of impacts uh, that the loss of ash can have on these, on these ecosystems. So with EAB likely to have devastating ecological and economic impacts as it spreads, how do we respond to these impacts? And the answer I'll argue is to combine multiple different science-based strategies in situation-specific combinations through an integrated pest management framework. And here's what I mean by that integrated pest management framework. The central goal is to have economically and ecologically acceptable pest impacts. And we use these different strategies that are around the outside there um, in different combinations to achieve that. So I'll briefly go through each of these strategies and then today's talk will take a deeper dive into research results on the monitoring end and on the uh, conservation and future restoration of ash. So first of all, preventative measures, slowing and preventing the spread of EAB is especially important still uh, as, as we're within states at this point, uh, buy it where you burn it, doing risk assessment to understand what areas are at high risk of emerald ash borer infestation, how far north the emerald ash borer can go, that kind of study is important to uh, this preventative strategy. Cultural resistance includes resistance breeding, so uh, creating ash trees that have resistance to emerald ash borer and can withstand its effects. So this is a picture of a, of a healthy surviving ash tree on the left and a uh, dead ash tree on the right that's been impacted. And then also potentially silvicultural practices. Biological controls, and of course, these are the both introduced parasitoids and native parasitoid insects 
that um, impact emerald ash borer as well as predators that can have impacts on emerald ash borer populations. Chemical controls, so insecticide treatment of trees, which is mostly in urban areas with specimen trees, although we also do some insecticide work in uh, forested areas on a small subset of trees to help preserve their um, genetic diversity. And then the monitoring work, monitoring is the foundation for all of the other strategies. You need monitoring to understand how well these strategies are working. You need monitoring to inform these strategies as you, as you move through them and implement them. Um, I'll be spending a large part of my presentation talking about our monitoring work, uh, both in Ohio and in Pennsylvania, and what we've learned from that. Uh, we monitor emerald ash borer, we monitor the ash population, as well as the impacts on the forest ecosystems. And here are the purple traps that we use and some dead ash trees in a, one of the forest plots we monitor. And then finally, mitigating that impact of emerald ash borer. And we, we think about two different frames of reference for mitigating impacts on EAB. First, we think about through restoration, mitigating the impact on the forest ecosystems where ash are being killed. And this might be through removal of invasive plants or planting of other non-ash tree species to fill those ecological niches that are uh, left empty when emerald ash borer takes the ash. And then the second way we think about it is through genetic conservation, um, either through collecting and storing seeds long-term or treating small numbers of ash trees with insecticide to preserve those trees. So I have many research projects that are part of a, a number of these different strategies to respond to EAB. And today, like I said, we'll start with the monitoring work on impacts of EAB in Ohio and Pennsylvania. We started monitoring impacts of emerald ash borer in Ohio back in 2005, set up a series of long-term monitoring plots where we monitored over 3,000 ash trees that were the larger size class ash trees uh, be, tracking them individually over time and also tracking the other tree species. And we had all five different ash species and a range of different um, densities and habitats represented in this uh, study. So I'll show you uh, the results of ash mortality of the larger size class of ash trees, 10 centimeters or larger in DBH. The uh, Symbols represent how much mortality has happened in the stand. So you'll see the circles are pretty low mortality. And then as you get up to black diamonds, that's very high mortality in those stands. You'll see more plots showing up over time and then disappearing. Um, that's not the spread of EAB. That's actually the spread of my research funding that allowed us to get out to the sites. So in 2005, we started in Northwest Ohio and the stands were, um, pretty healthy at that point. We didn't see much impact. And we started to see mortality showing up in 2007 in Northwest Ohio. By 2009, a lot of the forest stands in that Toledo area um, had experienced a high amount of mortality. By 2011, all of Northwest Ohio's stands were pretty much dead, and we started seeing mortality showing up in Central Ohio stands. And then by 2014, you can see there's um, a, a lot of mortality in Central Ohio as well. We did get funding again to go back out to all the sites in 2019, uh, and all of them had progressed to the black diamond state that where um, we had um, over 75% mortality in those sites. I wanted to just focus on what was actually alive still in 2019. Uh, and so you can see in the uh, chart at the top, um, the different size classes of ash and how many trees were alive. So over 20 centimeters DBH, we had 44 trees over 10 centimeters DBH, we had 47 trees, and that's out of the more than 3,000 trees that we had started with that were over 10 centimeters. 
And um, some of these trees were healthy, but some were in um, severe decline uh, in, in 2019. And then we had quite a few of those smaller size classes, the less than 10 centimeter DBH trees, and then the seedlings um, that, that were in our, we monitored those in smaller subplots. And just looking at the DBH of trees that we've been studying, I have two chart uh, graphs there, um, one from 2007 with all living ash trees and their DBH, and one in 2019 with all living ash trees and their DBH. And you can see in 2007, we have DBH ranging all the way up to 90 centimeters DBH, um, and we have you know, quite a few uh, trees in these, in these uh, larger size classes. And then by 2019, you just see that uh, curve just flatten as emerald ash borer just annihilates all of those larger size classes of trees above five centimeters DBH. Um, you're really mostly left with those much smaller uh, tree saplings. But we do have, you know, a number of trees that are still alive out there that are that are larger, and we'll talk a little more about them. Um, we do see some species differences. So there were very few large surviving white ash and black ash trees. I think we had six of each um, surviving that were over that 10 centimeter threshold. Um, most of those larger survivors were green ash, pumpkin ash and blue ash, and the blue ash especially um, seems to be doing something different. So when we have mixed stands of blue ash and white ash, um, or blue ash and green ash, the blue ash seems to get hit. So first, the white or green ash will get nearly completely killed, and then the blue ash will start getting killed, start getting picked off, but it does seem to have a greater survival rate uh, than the other species. We also monitored emerald ash borer in some of those long-term monitoring sites uh, in Northwest Ohio and Central Ohio. Uh, we used the purple panel traps and, and just kept, uh, catch emerald ash borer on the traps and count the number of emerald ash borer that we catch. So I'll first zoom in and show you results from three of our sites. Uh, Wildwood in Northwest Ohio, Stratford in Central Ohio, and Darby that's a little bit Southwest there. Uh, Darby was the one that got infested the last out of those three. So you can see the green line is ash that are alive. And so we're ticking along with all of the ash alive up until 2014 when you start to see the ash die. Um, the purple line is EAB caught on the traps. And so you see we started catching EAB in 2011 and those EAB populations started to creep up. At uh, Stratford in Central Ohio, uh, when we started, all of the ash trees were alive, but we had some pretty quick mortality and they were all dead by 2011. The emerald ash borer populations uh, were in that exponential increase, um, peaked in 2010 and that's typically what we see with the peak of emerald ash borer populations occurring when about 50% of the ash are dead. And then the EAB populations quickly crash as they've killed all their host trees um, and they go back to low levels. And then finally, wildwood up in Northwest Ohio, the trees were mostly healthy um, through 2007 and then we had very rapid mortality and they were um, completely dead by 2010. And you see that crash of the emerald ash borer population, but it's still persisting at low levels. We did continue to monitor emerald ash borer populations. And these are all the Northwest Ohio sites where we did that. So each site is a different color here in these stacked bars. So the emerald ash borer populations peaked in 2009 in some of the sites in 2010 and some of the other sites. Um, the 2009 bar should actually go up to 1,275. We had caught a lot um, at fallen timbers that year. And you see that crash of emerald ash borer populations after the ash trees die. 
But what we've seen, interestingly, is in some of these sites, we have seen kind of a, a little resurgence, a little bump in EAB populations in more recent years. <clears throat> in central Ohio, we have a similar picture. Um, emerald ash borer populations here peaked around uh, 2011, 2012 um, in, in our sites, um, and then crashed down to low levels. And they've persisted at pretty low levels since then in these central Ohio sites. So it'll be interesting to see if we end up getting another bump here, like we're seeing in Northwest Ohio. We do have plenty of ash regeneration at many of our sites. So these are the seedlings and saplings that were too small for EAB when it initially came through. And those remain in the sites and continue to grow. Uh, the seed bank of ash is very short lived. We had mast years in 2008, and then any sites were still, that were still alive in 2018 had a mast year for ash seed. Um, and once you have a mast year, you see new seedlings, um, like the picture on the bottom right with those big, long, distinctive cotyledons. Um, you see those coming up for the next two years, maybe the next three years, but then that's it, they're gone. So that's, um, you just have this remaining orphaned cohort of ash seedlings then that will continue to grow and will continue to track those to see how, how they do. Are they gonna continue to be hit by EAB once they grow up to susceptible size? We did track those ash trees after they died to see how quickly they would break up and fall down. And we found that that was pretty fast. Uh, within two years of the ash tree dying, 20% of those trees had fallen. And by six years after the ash tree died, about 80% had fallen. So the dead trees uh, are important habitat for a number of um, animals, particularly bats that like to roost beneath the bark of the ash trees. Um, the bark kind of sloughs off in big sheets and that makes a wonderful bat roosting habitat. Um, but those trees fall down um, fairly quickly and then that habitat is lost. And without having additional large trees on the landscape, that that habitat then is not available for those bats. Uh, we also see, of course, as those trees die, a pulse of coarse woody debris in the forest. And this is especially noticeable in floodplain forests where the water just washes that debris into large piles of, of dead wood. So the implications of this research for management are several. Uh, first of all, we see time and again that ash mortality and EAB population dynamics seem to follow a fairly predictable pattern. And that allows for planning of management actions. We also saw that we were seeing mortality in our stands no matter what the density of ash was, it didn't matter. So thinning and other silvicultural actions are unlikely to slow ash mortality within a stand. We also see ash trees becoming brittle and falling rapidly, creating that pulse of coarse woody debris that um, people need to plan for. And just from talking with a number of people, it is much easier to cut hazard ash trees while they're still alive. So planning is important um, as EAB arrives in, in new sites. So what about those surviving trees? Let's circle back to those and find out more about what's going on there. So at all of our sites combined, we have a, less than 3% of those larger ash trees remaining alive at those sites. I used to say less than 1% because that's what it was in Northwest Ohio um, and some of our Central Ohio sites. But as we look at some of these other sites, especially the blue ash ones, it's less than 3% overall. Um, some of those trees are declining while others appear healthy. And in some of the sites where we discovered a number of these trees, we actually surveyed the entire site, GPS, all of the living ash trees that were in that larger size class. And we're tracking those entire populations of ash over time to understand what those dynamics are gonna look like long-term. 
we do see that those um, live ash trees, which we've termed healthy live ash trees that are after that first wave of EAB, we've, we call them lingering ash trees because they're lingering longer than the other trees. We do see those live trees are often near dead ash trees that have been killed by EAB earlier. So this is a live ash tree on the left here and a dead ash tree on the right that was killed sometime earlier. We know emerald ash borer is really good at finding ash trees in stands, so we think it's doubtful that those trees were just missed somehow by emerald ash borer. So it's possible that those trees have rare traits that make them less preferred or even resistant to attack by EAB. And that's the next line of research we're pursuing um, in collaboration with Jennifer Cook, who runs the um, ash resistance breeding program. Um, so what's the future of these trees? We know EAB is persisting in these sites and in some places even having a little resurgence. Um, we're monitoring those populations over time and we have seen that many of those healthy lingering ash trees do stay healthy. Um, and we've also um, seen through some of Rachel Kapler's work that there are effects of neighboring ash trees on um, any healthy ash trees. Uh, Rachel's done some fantastic modeling work to look at long-term dynamics of the ash and look at you know, how, how are those populations going to do over time in different situations, and especially kind of playing with management actions to decrease the probability of extinction of these small remaining po remnant populations. And then, of course, collaborating with uh, Jennifer Cook's group to propagate these trees, uh, test them for resistance, and then use the resistant trees in a tree breeding program. Jennifer will be talking on this EAB University series in May, so I'd encourage you to turn it, tune in to her talk um, to hear the latest on what she's finding as she tests these trees for resistance. <clears throat> so there are multiple ways you can help with this effort. Um, if you're in some of those states that are far enough along to start looking for surviving trees, uh, it's important to watch for and preserve any lingering ash. You can submit them to a database like TreeSnap. They've got a very slick app that you can put on your phone to submit trees of multiple species um, so that scientists in breeding programs can uh, tap into that and use those trees. And there are other ways to help as well. If you uh, look at the Great Lakes Basin Forest Health Collaborative, Rachel Kapler is the coordinator for that. And there are multiple ways that uh, individuals as well as organizations can get involved. So as those ash trees are killed, that unleashes a cascade of effects on those forest ecosystems that they inhabit. So in addition to studying the effects of EAB on ash, we've been studying effects on other parts of those ecosystems, the native tree species, the invasive plants, and the understory plant communities are all responding to those gaps left by the ash trees, the soil community. The soil microbial communities can change, the bird communities can be impacted. The hydrology of the site can be impacted as the ash are no longer there to suck up that moisture. Um, and carbon and nutrient cycling can be impacted as well. I'll give you a couple of highlights um, from some of our work on the effects of, on native trees and invasive honeysuckle. So this picture shows um, a floodplain forest that was dominated by green ash and the green ash trees are all dead. And what you see underneath was this mid story of maple and elm trees that quickly expanded and filled in um, those gaps and formed a new canopy. What we've seen is that native tree species can respond very rapidly to ash mortality, um, but carbon uptake in those sites may still take a hit and decline because those trees aren't completely making up for the uh, loss of carbon uptake by the ash trees that have died. <clears throat> so on the y-axis of these two graphs is the relative growth rate of the other tree species in those sites where ash has died. 
And you can see there on in the graph on the left, the relative growth rate, not surprisingly, increases the more ash there was in the sites. So if you have a site that was really dominated by ash and the ash dies, you get a, a bigger boost in the growth of the other tree species. We also see differences in the response of different tree species. So the maples and the elms seem to have a really fantastic uh, growth response as the ash trees die. Um, other tree species, we've, we've also seen some response as well. Uh, and a former grad student of mine who now works with APHIS, Kyle Costello, did a neat dendrochronological study of maple and just found how quickly those ash, uh, maple trees respond to the death of ash. Their growth actually starts increasing as, as the ash are declining and starting to die. So there's no lag there. And that allows them to really fill in those gaps left by ash very quickly. Unfortunately, the invasive plants are also responding as the ash trees die and it, when in places where gaps open in the canopy. So invasive plants can be facilitated by those forest gaps. Uh, and of course, the invasives end up being correlated with declines in the native woody tree seedlings um, in the understory as they compete with them and shade them out. Uh, this is some work by Brian Hoven, uh, who collaborated with me in those monitoring plots. On the x-axis, there's ash decline index. So that's basically how much ash is in the stand and how dead it was. And on the y-axis is the growth rate of Lanicera macchiae, um, Amur honeysuckle. And so you can see the more ash there was and the worse condition the ash was in, the greater the growth of the honeysuckle in those, in those stands. So overall, our take home messages from some of that work is that we do have native tree species that can respond very rapidly to ash mortality. Um, and if you have enough mid-story tree density of those species, they can prevent light from increasing in the understory. They can really expand and fill in those gaps. Unfortunately, where you don't have enough uh, mid-story tree density, you can certainly see invasive plant species responding to that ash mortality. <clears throat> so that sums it up for the monitoring work on the impacts of EAB uh, on our ash populations and forests. It's a pretty devastating impact on ash species. And depending on the ash species and the ecosystem that it inhabits, it can potentially have large impacts on the forest ecosystem as well. However, we are seeing those glimmers of hope, right? The discovery of those lingering ash trees and the tree resistance breeding program is very promising. Um, there's also a lot of other fantastic ongoing work on other management strategies for conservation of ash species and reducing and mitigating the impact of EAB on forests. So I'm gonna give a quick update now on two of our lines of work. Um, the first is our work on ash conservation at the Allegheny National Forest, and the second update will be on our restoration work in ash floodplains. So it's important to conserve the genetic diversity of threatened and endangered species to allow for future restoration of the species. And we can accomplish this by collecting and storing long-term ash seeds. And I know a number of you have probably participated in ash seed collection programs um, and sent off those seeds for that long-term storage. That's really important stuff. Um, the other way we can do ash conservation is by protecting a small number of mature ash trees by ongoing insecticide treatments. And either of these two methods of conserving that genetic diversity basically buys us time for the development of other strategies like biocontrols so that um, we still have that genetic diversity available for restoration of the species. <clears throat> Uh, and so I'll give you some highlights from a neat genetic conservation project that we have at the Allegheny National Forest. As you notice, we have many different partners and collaborators on this project. Um, the purpose of this project was to have in situ conservation of ash genetic diversity at the ANF um, by treating with insecticide a subset of their white ash trees. 
And we also wanted to monitor the progression of EAB and ASH mortality. This is a really different landscape than Ohio. So Ohio, um, especially the parts of Ohio I was working in with my monitoring plots um, in Northern and Western and Central Ohio, uh, forests are, are fairly small parcels of land surrounded either by agricultural land or by urban areas. Meanwhile, at the Allegheny National Forest, you have this very large contiguous forest landscape. So we wanted to see if ash mortality proceeded any differently in that kind of landscape. We also wanted to treat test treatment efficacy. So how well does the insecticide work and what factors affect how well it works? And then test for associational protection. So that's, um, the protection that untreated ash trees might get just from being near ash trees that are treated with insecticide. So we um, have 27 sites at the Allegheny National Forest, um, each with 20 trees in them that are treated with insecticide. Those uh, sites vary in ash density. And so the other trees beyond that 20 trees that's treated are all untreated within those sites. And you know that's only one potential way we could have chosen to arrange it. There are other ways. Maybe we could have done 10 sites and had 200 treated trees or four sites, um, each with 50 treated trees. Um, so one of the things we wanted to understand was, you know, how do you get the biggest bang for your buck if you want to do this kind of in situ conservation of genetic diversity? And so Charlie Flower led a really great study where they sampled leaves from 330 ash trees in 17 sites across the forest and did genetic analysis um, with, with several collaborators. And what we found was that the insecticide treatment had conserved about 97% of the genetic diversity on the Allegheny National Forest, which just blows my mind that you can save 500 trees out of the many, many, many thousands of trees and get um, a large portion of the genetic diversity conserved. We found that getting the best genetic bang for your buck um, would depend on focusing on more treatment sites. So having at least 10 trees per treatment site. Um, and then rather than adding more trees to a site, adding other sites and working with a geneticist to do genetic analysis beforehand so that you can choose sites that have very different genetics. Um, so you can choose optimal combinations of those sites and that can lead to a 20% cost savings, which is tremendous as you're having to retreat these trees every three years. Uh, we also set up uh, other monitoring plots across the Allegheny National Forest, actually all the way back in 2010 before EAB um, even arrived at the ANF. Uh, and these provide a comparison for those ash treatment plots and also help us understand how ash mortality is progressing across the forest. So this is the canopy health condition of the ash trees at the Allegheny National Forest back in 2010. And so green dots are healthier trees and red dots are um, pretty much dead. So you can see most of the forest was fairly healthy at that point. You did have some less healthy sites and this was not due to emerald ash borer. This is due to sites that are um, upland sites, um, upper slope sites near the top of um, these large hills. Uh, having lower base cations. And so that cation um, leaching that's happened in these sites does affect the health of the ash trees there. As emerald ash borer started to appear in 2015 in the southern part of the forest, you see mortality from emerald ash borer showing up there. And then it just rapidly spread through the forest. Um, by 2019, we had tremendous um, mortality of ash. And here's 2021, these are just the um, untreated sites in the forest. And you can see that that mortality has spread throughout the forest. We do have a few sites in the far Northeast part that are a little bit healthier. And then comparing those treatment plots to those untreated control plots, we saw a really interesting pattern. 
So the red line here, the red dots here are those untreated plots with no insecticide treatment. And you can see in 2015, the mean canopy condition on the y-axis, one is healthy and five is dead. So as the lines slope upward, that means trees are dying. And so there's um, the trees were around a average of category three in 2015. Um, so we had some trees that were healthy, some trees that were dying and dead, kind of a mix. And then we see those trees dying over time. You can ignore 2020 there, like everything else, uh, COVID screwed up our plot monitoring in 2020, and we only got to a small subset of those um, untreated plots in 2020. And you can see by 2021, um, we have nearly complete mortality of those untreated plots. However, when you look at the treated plots, something different is happening. So the treated trees that have been injected with insecticide in the treated plots are the green triangles. And you see with those, um, those trees have generally remained fairly healthy over time. So we had some that were initially not healthy that went on to die and many others uh, stabilized at a category one or category two and seem to be doing really well. The other interesting thing you see is the yellow circles. Those are the untreated trees that are in the treated plots. So they're near the treated trees. And what you see with those is that they're actually um, seeing some effect of being near those treated trees. We, we see that they are much healthier than the untreated trees that are elsewhere in the forest. So we do see this um, a suggestion here of, of associational protection of those trees. So we'll, we'll be continuing to monitor those over time to see if that holds up over the long term or not. Uh, management implications of these studies, insecticide treatment can protect trees. Uh, the treatment does work better in the trees that are healthy initially when you treat them. Uh, once a tree is too far gone and emerald ash borer has disrupted water and nutrient flow, it also disrupts the flow of those insecticides and you don't get good protection. Uh, we do see that untreated trees may, may get some protection from being near treated trees. Uh, we're gonna look into that more uh, with some data analysis this winter. And the treatment results might vary depending on, on the tree's environment. We do have those differences in upper versus lower slope um, conditions at the ANF. So we're gonna look closely into that as well to see how that plays out. And then finally here, I'll, I'll move on to talking about some of our re restoration work in ash floodplain forests in Ohio. Um, we planted Dutch elm disease tolerant American elm from our American elm breeding program, very similar to what Jennifer's doing with the ash. Um, we're finding survivor trees of American elm, testing them for resistance and, and breeding them. Uh, we also planted pin oak and sycamore in these sites. And we were looking at what factors affect the growth and survival of those planted tree seedlings in these floodplains that are impacted by emerald ash borer. Um, so we planted over 3,000 trees in three different sites here in Ohio. And as I said, pin oak, sycamore, and American elm were planted. Uh, they were planted on a grid um, with the locations of the trees um, uh, the identity of each tree randomized for each spot. You can see the river there at the bottom in blue. Uh, we put cages around some of the trees to protect them from deer. And then of course there were existing other tree species in the sites or ash trees that were dying of emerald ash borer. So the trees are that were planted, some of them are in very shady conditions and some of them are in more sunny conditions. So their microsite uh, varied tremendously in terms of light exposure. And then of course, we're in a floodplain and floodplains flood. And so we, uh, we also have variation in flooding at each tree seedling. We did measure the light level at each planted seedling so that we could kind of capture some of that microsite variability. 
So here's a couple of our planted trees. On the left here is an elm that's planted uh, next to an ash tree that hasn't yet been killed by emerald ash borer. And on the right is a sycamore in one of our cages. And so uh, three years after planting, um, we, we measured survival of the trees and we found that both the tree species as well as the initial seedling size at planting, we planted two different sizes, um, mattered so the bigger seedlings did better. Uh, the cages had a tremendous effect on preventing them from being eaten by deer and the light level above the seedling uh, mattered as well. And this is an interesting example of this interaction effect we saw between tree species and canopy openness. <clears throat> so the elms are here in blue, and on the x-axis we have four different categories of percent canopy openness, so how, how light it was. So on the far left there, less than 5% canopy openness, those are very shady microsites, and you can see the elm was surviving fairly well in those sites, 50% survival, but the oak and sycamore took a big hit in those more shady sites. And as you get out, go over into the higher light conditions, greater than 20% canopy openness, we have good survival of all three species. So that shows that the elms do have a little more shade tolerance than some of these other floodplain species, which is really kind of a <clears throat> unique characteristic to have both that flood tolerance and that shade tolerance. <clears throat> we went back uh, this past year to look at 10 year survival of these restoration plantings. And you can see in the picture, we have uh, the um, flagging, the orange flagging on two of our elms that were surviving in this row of trees. And then behind them with the green leaves there, you can see one of the surviving sycamores. So some of the trees survived really well and have grown and are giant and beautiful. <clears throat> And in other sites, we did not have very good survival at all. Uh, floodplains are really challenging places to do restoration. Uh, what we are seeing is that the larger planting stock sizes, um, as well as very well secured deer protection are, are key to having um, that survival in these floodplain sites. <clears throat> we are seeing that Dutch elm disease tolerant elm can perform well in these floodplain conditions. And of course, the planting techniques and the microsite selection can improve success. <clears throat> well, all right, let's wrap this up here. Uh, I'm hopeful that integrated pest management strategies will allow us to minimize and mitigate the ecological and economic impacts of emerald ash borer. Um, there's a lot of scientists, including me, who are working on all of these different tools and strategies for managing EAB. And what I really think <clears throat> will be exciting long term into the future is that these strategies may be even more powerful <clears throat> when they're combined in different situation specific ways. And with that, I just want to take a second to thank the many amazing summer seasonal field crews that have been involved in establishing these experiments and collecting the data, um, many different fantastic partners and the funding sources who have made this work possible. And with that, if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. And we do have time. So let's see. Um, I've got a few questions for you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Cliff uh, Sadoff asks, given the rapid rate of tree failure of ash killed by EAB, how would you advise park managers trying to mitigate hazards along trails or other places where people or property reside? So I've worked with uh, several different um, metro parks as well as metro park districts, as well as um, Department of Natural Resources, different types of land ownerships. And I have seen a number of different approaches. One approach is to decide to treat the trees, the ash trees that are, you know, if you have spectacularly big, beautiful ash trees along a trail and 
<clears throat> they could potentially fall on the trail, starting to treat those well in advance of um, those trees declining and dying. So you want to start your treatment while the tree is still healthy once emerald ash borer is in the area. I've seen that done. I've also seen people preemptively remove those trees. If they decide they don't want to treat them, they know they're going to die. It's easier and safer to cut the trees um, when they're still healthy and alive before they've become brittle and dangerous to cut. So they'll go ahead and preemptively cut those down to keep the trails safe. Um, only needing to cut the ones that are along the trail or in picnic or park parking lot areas. Um, you don't need to cut the ones that are out you know, in the middle of the forest. Um, and then the other approach that I, I've seen at uh, one of the state nature preserves is they actually close down the trails uh, for a period of eight years, um, knowing how quickly those trees um, die and fall down. Once they're dead, they were able to close the trail for that period of time. And then um, the plan is to reopen it uh, once, once the majority of those trees have fallen. So there, there are a few different approaches, but you know, having a plan in advance is really important. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here. I think you may have answered most of this, but you may want to add to it. Um, Anne asks, do we know how EAB is surviving at low levels after mature ash dies just on smaller trees at tolerable levels on lingering ash? And then she says, great to see the long-term monitoring and resistant trees work. Thanks. Yeah, that's exactly what we think is going on is, is you know, they, they are potentially infesting these lingering ash at very low levels. And we have this, you know, tremendous amount in some of these places of smaller saplings that are growing up into larger sizes. And so those are, um, those are potentially uh, sustaining that EAB population over time in those areas. All right, um, then Cliff also has another um, question. Great story about how loss of ash affects forest communities. Do you have thoughts on how loss of ash affects regeneration of economically important species like white and red oaks? Regeneration is a big issue in Indiana. That is a really good question. I have not looked specifically at regeneration of the oaks. I would need to look back at uh, Brian Hoven's more recent paper that he published and, and see. I know he had separated out some of the effects on the more shade tolerant um, seedlings versus shade intolerant species um, like, like some of the oaks. Um, so yeah, I, I would need to look back at that to remind myself what the, what the result is on, on some of that. Okay, um, Carolyn Abood had um, a question about your slide that had um, the treated and untreated plots. Um, she, she asked, should the green triangles on that chart say treated trees? Because it says, I think it says untreated treed, treated plots, the little green triangle. Okay, yeah, the green, the green triangles were treated trees in treated plots. Did I have that labeled wrong? I'm sorry about that. I, yeah, I think it might have been, um, but we'll forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think, yeah, I, I, I just thought maybe you'd want to clarify that, so. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, you're right, you're right. They all said untreated, didn't they? Sorry about that. Yes, the green triangles were the treated trees in the treated plots, and then the the yellow circles were the untreated trees in the treated plots. Good catch. I will, I will correct that. Someone was awake and really watching. <laughs> <laughs> Most Very of good. Them, I'm sure. Nice. Uh, Cliff says nice work on the associational protection in the Allegheny forest. Were the treated trees in a mostly ash forest or were they mixed? Could you comment on the proximity of the untreated trees to the treated trees? It would be fantastic if you could ascribe some sort of distance to the protection shadow. Yes. So in each, so each of these plots were 100 meters radius. So they're very big plots. And within those plots, the number of trees ranged from 26 trees all the way up to like 200 trees. And then of those trees, we randomly, we randomized choosing which 20 trees got treated. 
um, in the plots that did not have very many trees in the plot, we made sure that the untreated trees weren't like all out on the very edge. So they are, you know, they're within that 100 meter plot with the other treated trees. I think the main factor that's going to be really interesting to look at that's causing some variability is the density of untreated trees in the plot, right? Because if you have a plot that just has 26 trees in it, 20 of those are treated and only six of those are untreated. So there's a lot more treated trees than untreated. Whereas in these, uh, in some of these sites that just are a stand that has very high density of ash um, and you have 200 ash trees in there, you've got 180 untreated trees and only 20 that are treated, right? And so in those, we expect there'll be some kind of threshold density where that associational protection kind of starts to break down. And that's, that's one of the things we're really interested in, in looking at. And then of course, the upper slope, lower slope issue of the base cations and how that affects um, that associational protection. Because if, if, the, uh, if the soil microsite of that plot um, is allowing those trees to be more healthy in general, we might see a different result than in a, a soil condition on an upper slope where the trees are not as healthy. So we're going to really jump into that this, this, uh, this winter here over the next couple of months and, and dig into some of those questions um, as to what, what might be affecting that associational protection that we're seeing. Okay. Um, Thomas Valley asks, what is the potential for diligently enforced quarantines to prevent the spread of EAB over the Rockies? Gosh, we we did not have tremendous success in the east with <laughs> with preventing the spread of emerald ash borer. Uh, I, I wish people all the luck in the world uh, with it, you know, in the west. Uh, so I I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. But it you know I I think awareness is key and just trying to drive that message to people to not you know, not move firewood, try to, you know, pay attention to, to movement of, of uh, untreated wood. Uh, but yeah, it, it, emerald ash borer does seem to be a really tricky one in terms of preventing spread. Okay, Linda asks, is 2022 another year that the residential homeowner will have to treat professionally? We have treated at least twice over the past four years. Ashes have been saved, but thinned considerably. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what we're seeing with our emerald ash borer trap catches is we are not seeing emerald ash borer disappear entirely anywhere. Um, it's, it's around. Um, and so the only sure way at this point to to preserve a tree is to continue that treatment over time. If it's, you know, some, some of the treatments are yearly and some of the treatments are every two, two years or every three years. So, you know, we, that's as far as we know at this point, the only sure way to preserve the tree is continue those, those treatments. Okay, Julie Gould says, although it's a long-term solution, we are finding that parasitoid wasps are doing a very good job at protecting regenerating ash after the EAB outbreak collapses. We are also doing studies in New York and Wisconsin where we are integrating insecticides to save large reproductively active trees while releasing parasitoids to protect the trees in the future. She wanted to make that comment, so... Thanks, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Todd says, I work mainly in urban areas. There is a local city arborist in the Detroit suburbs advising homeowners that there is no longer a risk from EAB. <laughs> what is your advice? Ah. And I think you've, you've kind of already answered that. But yeah, yeah, I've kind of already answered that. I, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's unfortunate when there's, when there's some misinformation out there on that. And I, you know, I know EAB populations do get lower, but we don't, I don't have any evidence. I haven't seen any evidence from elsewhere that they, they go away and that there's no longer a risk, unfortunately. 
Yes, I had um, a question, just so all of you know, I had a question from the EAB.info website with a, a, a woman who asked, who was told by her exterminator that EAB was the cause of the insect damage and, and some wall, um, some wood walls in her attic. Oh, attic. No. And uh, she wanted to know uh, if, if we could collaborate that and uh, let her know what to do and of course, we kind of set her straight quite quickly that, you know, EAB does not infest um, dead wood, and uh, that was not correct. The information was not correct. And uh, so anyway, wow. just so you know, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Anne says, we have some sites in Maryland, too, with paired treatment and biocontrol release. It is still spreading on the Delmarva Peninsula, where we have had some of our largest ash wetlands. So we'll see if biocontrol releases will have an effect at high population levels. Um, she just wanted to make that comment. Um, mm -hmm. He says, in Southern Ohio, I am finding lots of dead ash, but I am also finding some ash that appear healthy and some ash that appear, appear unhealthy. Do you expect the ash that appear very unhealthy to continue to decline and die? Or may some of these recover and survive? What we've seen in our monitoring of those ash populations at those sites that did have a mix of, you know, declining ash and healthy ash after, after that wave of emerald ash borer is the declining ones don't seem to recover. They continue to decline and they die. The only the ones that are healthy seem to remain healthy over time. And actually one of the things that Rachel, that came out of some of Rachel Kapler's work is if you have a healthy ash tree, um, a healthy lingering ash, but it's surrounded very close by, um, you know, within 20 feet of very unhealthy dying ash trees, those can have a negative impact on the, on the healthy lingering survivor ash tree. So removal of, you know, very unhealthy dying ash trees to help protect those remaining healthy trees may be a strategy that can be used. We haven't, you know, we haven't scientifically tested that strategy yet, but that's what that research may suggest that that, that could be a useful way to go. All right, thank you. Um, Anthony Downs asks, are resistant trees less palatable or is it a, is it a function of defense? So both, and, and tune in for Jennifer's talk in May, because she's going to get into this, but uh, the, the, the trees, so Therese Poland has done feeding and landing tests on foliage from them, and some of them are just less preferred by the adult beetles. The volatile that they emit, you know, don't smell quite right to them or, or aren't as attractive to them. And so they're not landing on those trees and feeding on them and presumably laying eggs on them as much. And then, um, so that's some of the trees. Other trees that are the survivors, Jennifer actually puts emerald ash borer eggs on the genetically identical copies that she makes of the trees by propagating them clonally um, through cuttings and grafting. And so she puts the emerald ash borer eggs on them and actually finds that the ash trees kill the emerald ash borer larva. So they, they can have resistance that way too, in terms of protection. And then, as um, she moves forward with the breeding program, uh, you know, you're breeding trees together that both have good resistance, but may have slightly different mechanisms of resistance. And so the progeny could be even better than those parents. Um, so tune in, hear all the details on that because it's, it's really exciting. But yes, it's, it's complicated. There are multiple different mechanisms of resistance at work. Thank you. Um, how much, okay, I don't know if this is really something that you can answer, but um, how much of EAB spread would you estimate was due to the movement of nursery stock prior to the federal quarantine? I have no idea. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I have no I, idea. Yeah, I don't, yeah I, don't, I don't even, you know, that might be some. It's a good question. Buddy, it's a yeah, good from question. APHIS maybe have a little more idea of what's going on with that. I know they, you know, we're trying to track some things, but. Right. Um, let's see. Um, Cliff Sadoff says he agrees with you that protection is for life for ash trees. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. I got it. Okay. 
You're getting thanks from some of the participants. Great job, Kathleen. Thank you. Great at, from Greg Edge. Um, and I think that's about what we've got here. We have one comment that one of our, our folks have been treating our ash tree in our yard and they believe it is forever as well, but it's well worth it, she says. So. Yeah, I mean, some of these trees are just beautiful, huge trees. And I'm, I'm glad people are treating them because they're just amazing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we have the insecticide treatments available that we can do that. And yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, that looks like that's all the questions and comments we have right now. We're still getting people saying on the chat, thank you very much for um, the great presentation. And it was very informative. Um, I'm going to leave you now, everyone, and wanted you to know that this recorded webinar will be on the eab.info website on the EAB University page. And you will also be getting an email tomorrow that will uh, give you some more information on if you have other questions for Kathleen that you thought of after the webinar. And for those of you wanting, wanting CEUs, you will have instructions there on how to uh, acquire those. So thanks again, Kathleen. This is, it's always great having you with, uh, with us at EAB University. And I hope you all you and everyone else that participated, y'all have a good day. And I'm glad to know that you have power and internet. <laughs> <Still>. <laughs> yes, <laughs> knock on wood. I'm glad it.